In the course of human history, there are certain time-locked truths that God releases at strategic intervals when they are most needed and profitable for the generation at hand. I can think of few cases more expedient than the reemergence of the book Earth's Earliest Ages by George H. Pember, recently resurrected into print by Defense Publishing, thanks to the strategic insight of Steve Quayle and Tom Horn. Earth's Earliest Ages is not only a wonderfully written literary work, but a tactical manual for the very days in which we now live. Born in 1836 and deceased in 1910, George Hawkins Pember was a highly regarded English theologian affiliated with the Plymouth Brethren. His literary works include The Antichrist, Babylon and the Coming Kingdom, The Great Prophecies of the Centuries Concerning Israel and the Gentiles, Mystery Babylon the Great, and others. Earth's Earliest Ages is considered by many to be his magnus opus and has been touted worldwide as a classical masterpiece. Pember wrote the first edition of Earth's Earliest Ages in 1876 during a crucial time in the history of our planet, a time that is often overlooked, preceded as it was by the bloodiest war in American history, the Civil War, and superseded by the bloodiest war the world had ever seen, World War I. It was a time of perceived peace in the Western world, an interim between conflicts, and yet, unbeknownst to most, something sinister was beginning to rise from the ashes of Earth's dark and archaic past. With incredible foresight, George Pember saw this rising threat and identified it as a global phenomenon involving intercourse with demons and the return of the Nephilim. Pember's original intent for writing Earth's Earliest Ages was twofold. First, as an attempt to remove some of the difficulties usually associated with the, with the commencing chapters of Genesis in light of the geological discoveries of his day, pointing to the probability of a very old Earth. And second, he endeavored to show that the characteristic features of the days of Noah were reappearing, and, therefore, that the days of the Son of Man could not be far distant. George Pember had the incredible foresight to recognize the esoteric connection between the earliest ages of our planet and the New Age spiritualism now pervading our societies. Now, the purpose of this analysis is by no means to provide you with an exhaustive essay on the book Earth's Earliest Ages, but instead to offer a brief summary of its content and to highlight the urgency of understanding its message in the context of contemporary times. The book begins by addressing the age of the earth and the creation story. Pember makes an astute observation concerning the prevalent Christian narrative that God created the earth in a state of disarray and darkness. He contends that this popular error in regard to the creation sprang from the pag pagan doctrine of chaos. Simply stated, the doctrine of chaos teaches that in the beginning was chaos, and the earth was an unformed and confused bulk, suspended in the void of space, which was later molded and shaped by the hands of the gods. Since creation from chaos was the religious doctrine of both the Greeks and the Romans, Pember believed that it had infiltrated Christian doctrine as well. Concerning the influence of the chaos legend in Christianity, he writes, this doctrine, the doctrine of chaos, ancient and widespread as it was in the time of our Lord, did not fail to influence the real as well as the spurious Christians. The Orthodox Christians gave clear testimony to the influence of the popular belief in their interpretation of the commencing chapter of Genesis. For they made the first verse signify the creation of a confused mass of elements, out of which the heavens and the earth were formed during the six days, understanding the next sentence to be a description of this crude matter before God shaped it. And their opinion has descended to our days, but it does not appear to be substantiated by Scripture, and the guile of the serpent may be detected in its results. For how great a contest has it provoked between the church and the world! How ready a handle do the geological difficulties involved in it present to the assailants of Scripture? With what perplexity do we behold earth gloomy with the shadow of pain and death ages before the sin of Adam? How many young minds have been turned aside by the absolute impossibility of defending what they have been taught 
to regard as biblical statements. And lastly, in carrying on the dispute, how much precious time has been wasted by able servants of God who would otherwise have been more profitably employed? Whereas order out of chaos was, and is to this day, a Luciferian principle, chaos out of order is perhaps the true biblical narrative expressed in the first two verses of Genesis. In other words, in the beginning God created order, and as was the case in our world, insubordination brought corruption and chaos, which ultimately led to judgment and destruction. The idea is that there exists a significant interval of time between the first and second verses of Genesis. In theological circles, this is referred to as the gap theory. The gap theory, also called gap creationism or restoration creationism, postulates that an indefinite span of time exists between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Proponents of the theory argue that verse 2 is describing a reforming or restoration of the order that God had originally created in verse 1, but was destroyed in a catastrophic judgment event. The theory, though hotly contested, is not without biblical substantiation. In most Bibles, the first two verses of Genesis read as follows. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Pember contends that the translation of the phrase, the earth was without form and void, in verse 2, is not the most accurate rendering from the Hebrew, but, quote, a glaring illustration of the influence of the chaos legend, end quote. He notes that Julius I, renowned 19th century Hebrew scholar, renders the term without form, or tohu in the Hebrew, as ruin, or desolation, and the term void, or bohu in the Hebrew, as emptiness, or that which is empty. He also points out that the Hebrew words tohu and bohu are only found together in two other passages in Scripture, and in both cases are clearly used to express the ruin caused by an outpouring of the wrath of God. He explains, In a prophecy of Isaiah, after a fearful description of the fall of Edomia and the day of vengeance, we find the expression, He shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion, and the stones, or as it should be translated, the plummet, of emptiness. Now, confusion and emptiness are, in the Hebrew, the same words as those rendered without form and void. And the sense is that just as the architect makes careful use of line and plummet in order to raise the building in perfection, so will the Lord too make the ruin complete. There is, then, no possibility of mistaking the meaning of the words in this place. And the second passage is even more conclusive. For, in describing the devastation of Judah and Jerusalem, Jeremiah likens it to the pre-Adamite destruction and exclaims, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord, and by his fierce anger. For thus hath the Lord said, The whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. As a final observation on the second verse of Genesis, Pember notes that the verb translated as was, or hayah in the Hebrew, can also be translated as to become. An example of this can be found in the history of Lot's wife, of whom we are told that she became a pillar of salt. Although Pember does not mention it in the book, other competent scholars have argued that the first word of verse 2, the word and, should be more accurately rendered but. Credence to this view is provided in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament compiled by 70 Hebrew scribes, roughly 300 years before Christ, which actually renders the first word of Genesis 1 verse 2 as but rather than and. Now, all of these textual nuances may appear to be insignificant when reviewed separately, but when all of the changes are employed in the verse together, we get a very different view of the opening scene in the beginning of Genesis.
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but the earth became desolate and empty, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. If this is indeed the correct rendering of the first two verses of Genesis, as George Pember suggests, and as other competent Bible scholars still contend to this day, then what we have is nothing less than a paradigm-shifting view of the planet on which we live, and a hidden secret that may harbor many clues to some of the most enigmatic mysteries of our times. Stay tuned for further episodes on the book Earth's Earliest Ages. Reporting for SteveQuell.com, I'm Timothy Alberino, and that's my analysis.